What do you have for breakfast? Uh, eggs. Oh, I know why I can't hear anything. Not, not plugged in. No wonder you left the BBC. I think the BBC left me. Oh. Out on the open road. Where are you taking me? I'm driving us, Paul, out into the Mignite Hills, and specifically to a to a cottage my dad lived at in the late 50s and 60s, which is more remote than you can possibly imagine. Always before starting up the hill, close the eyes and draw a deep breath to see if the vast ache of emptiness is still there. And if so, to assume the courage to confront it. And so I return to beyond the pale, where it is held by certain elements that I belong. He really thought he ought to be able to have you if he wanted you. The year is whipping away, like the last foot of a cobra vanishing down a drain pipe. Something frightened him. But I have a kind of dulled belief that I'm being battered into the shape of a writer. She stood on a grave, poured paraffin over herself and set herself on fire. More than any other in my life, I have been the prisoner of two events. Striking a pregnant Joan and that moment in Iraq. I think there might have been an accident. Hello, I'm Saul Wordsworth author, musician, journalist and son of former Fleet Street journalist Christopher Wordsworth, whose diaries are the subject of this podcast series. At the end of the previous episode, my father and his lover Sue Russell were finally separated after Sue had been sectioned, a moment of sobriety for my dad. My younger period of physical indulgence in which I became actually blocked. I was like a bullock that breaks into the corn and eats till it is near suffocation. The only way to save it is to puncture it with a knife. So the knife of Sue's madness brought me to. Without money or a job, my father was now homeless. I should be homesick if I had a home to be sick in. And after five years spent with an increasingly unwell Susan Russell, somewhat disoriented. After life with Sue, in dealing with other people, it is as though one were on leave from a distant and savage war. Nothing is quite real. None of the things said seem to have any real relevance. But he did have friends. Three of them, Chris Oliver, John Earle and Jeremy Brooks, their belief in his potential as a writer undimmed, approached the local forestry and, pooling their limited resources, rented him a run-down gamekeeper's cottage, Tea Keeper, in the Mignite Hills, an area of undulating and unforgiving moorland, close to, but separate from, the Kreuzer Valley. The Mignite was known for its inhospitable environment and sparse population, which in 1959, when my dad moved into Tea Keeper, amounted to one. Him. You came from Bala through to Trospano. You would skirt along the big night hills. That's the voice of my dad's friend Ivan Nottingham, who appeared in the previous episode, and whom I interviewed using a pretty basic tape recorder when on a fact-finding mission in the area back in 2005, hence the audio quality. And this cottage was right in the middle of these hills. It was in the middle of nowhere? It was in the middle of nowhere, yeah. Really in the middle of nowhere. Well, it was um, one of these semi-derelict Welsh cottages in a very isolated place where very hardy people used to live on very little... And that's Eleanor Brooks, who has appeared in all previous episodes. Where appropriate, I have spliced the two interviews we recorded together, 15 years apart. 
It had stone floors. It had a big kitchen with a big old kitchen table. It hadn't been modernized in any way. Tea Keeper is a building with no business being there, seven miles from civilization, and set back from a ribbon of road that serves little obvious purpose, save than to service this property. Never in my life have I come across a more solitary spot. This is extreme isolation, seclusion, an open prison for one. When my father needed anything, food, company, warmth, he would have to walk up and down, seven miles each way, to and from the cottage, in all weathers, exposed to the elements. Little wonder when I was growing up, he never fancied a stroll. The more primitive, weaker, or less adaptable forms of life are always pushed out from the centre to the remoter areas. So self. Well, yeah, here we are. Where are we? We are on the Mignite, which is a rather bleak area of exposed moorland about seven miles due east of the village of Fistinyog. And we're outside the cottage Tea Keeper, which is where my dad stayed for, I think, pretty much the last year of his, of his time. In Today, Tea Keeper is, is a fully refurbished National Trust property rented out to stargazers and ramblers for a minimum of three nights. We're talking about, I mean, it's a six miles from here to Festinio. Six miles to the nearest person, yeah. Should we see if there's anyone in? Hi, I'm Roger Cook. There's definitely someone staying here at the moment, but they're clearly not here this afternoon. Despite there being no answer, it was worth visiting for the starkness of its solitude, which is both tremendously romantic and vaguely chilling. OK, the cottage is behind you, and in front of you... Gorse and moorland that seem to stretch for as far as the eye can see, and... Also, nothing else. There's not a pylon. There's no signs of civilization. There's just a road, a huge road that has no business being here except really to service this cottage. As we said, this is a great place to stay for a, a long weekend, for tramping, hiking, stargazing, maybe even a week, maybe even a couple of weeks. But the idea of being here on your own for a year isn't especially appealing. Voyaging among the moors at night in my little oppressive bathosphere of loneliness. 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 I think if we look through the window, we can see um, an open fire. My dad would have stoked desperately in the winter time. It's quite a sizable property, but it was pretty much in a state of total disrepair when he moved here. Should we have a look around the side? After Sue's money ran out, my father had been reliant on national assistance, the modern-day equivalent of job seekers allowance. But as Ivan Nottingham explained to me back in 2007, he was claiming an unemployment benefit and there was very little work in the area that he could do because he would put himself down as an author. Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> around about this time, they said, well, if you can't find a job here, we'll have to retrain you to do some sort of work that, you, that we can find a job for you. Yeah. And he said, uh, on your bike, I'll yeah. forget it. So he, he, he then he lost his money. He lost his money. I mean, it's a good space. But when your father was here, the stonework, the walls, yeah. are solid. Yeah. I think the roof looks quite new. Yeah. But I think pretty barren inside so you had the brickwork and uh, he had a shell of a property but that's pretty much all there was there was no electricity 
as far as I know, no running water, no telephone, no form of communication with the outside world. He'd already been rejected by social services because he refused to take a, some kind of menial work in the local area. So he was really subsisting. And the time that might... Aside from occasional winnings from New Statesman crossword competitions, my father had no income. Without money, he would rely on periodic acts of kindness from friends, in particular his closest neighbour, the communist farmer John Jones. But for a man of huge appetites, he was most certainly going without. Putting my hands on my backside, now hollow-cheeked, this diet of bread and marmalade. One of the aspects of penury is that one eats what is available. One may breakfast off bread and onions or dine off cereal for long, unrelieved periods. Tea and golden syrup, cigarettes in the grate, shriveled moths in the cups. Time for me, as for Africa, has burst its confines. Every hour has the weight of a year. Eternity begins at home. Sometimes, while out walking, he would collect roadkill, the odd rabbit, or on a good day, perhaps a pheasant or grouse. Occasionally, when there was nothing else, he would resort to cattle cake found in nearby fields. Mostly, though, and with a trout stream running behind Tea Keeper and others doubling as poaching opportunities, he would rely on his expertise with his fishing rod for sustenance and survival. This is no river for old men. The staircase of rocks, then deep pools. One must be half goat, half heron. And yet if fish do not come to my fly, I am not happy until I have followed with my eyes a natural insect down the pool and seen that it too has been ignored. So too with books. Sometimes the very efficacy of words as I use them doubted. Pick up library books and glance at excerpts just to confirm that they are written with words strung together, as it might be I might string them. Ah yes, the novel. Let's not forget that Oliver, Earl and Brooks had rented Tea Keeper, ostensibly as a place for my dad to finally, possibly, hopefully, lay down his magnum opus. Luckily for this podcast, there is an abundance of material. Beautiful writing, my dad writing beautifully, yet paradoxically, about his inability to write. Because for my father, writing meant only one thing. Fiction, prose, a novel, the novel. Penning the great novel was the be-all and end-all, the yardstick by which he would measure his success, and therefore, his failure. Thinking, thinking about the novel, so that it becomes pointless. Repeat a word to yourself endlessly. You strip it of all meaning. Finally, you strip meaning itself of meaning. What I am fighting more than anything is this self-obsession. Because I find my thoughts are stunted by it. It atrophies my attempt to construct character or incident. The creative urge comes in waves and recedes like nausea. The year is whipping away like the last foot of a cobra vanishing down a drainpipe. God help us all. His friend and local farmer, John Jones, used to leave a sack of potatoes every so often. And otherwise, he was fishing for his supper in the local stream, chatting to the sheep and writing in his diaries. When I pull back the dusty lace curtains, drawn to keep the crone flies away from the candlelight, I face the day with aversion, like changing the gauze bandages on an old lingering wound. A great disadvantage of the life in which one has to find one's own stimulus for one's own resources is that, in these long, barren stretches with nothing to fall back on, one needs the cigarettes, 
the coffee insistently as a progress surrogate, and it becomes a matter of sheer economical stress. Not only is the question of water critical in the desert, but when one finds out one's need has become so terrible that the temptation is to bathe in it, to paint on the sand from a terrible joy. Woodshed. My dad may have stocked some of that very wood. It's not that old. <laughs> the image conjured, to me at least, was of a bleak, barren cottage, orderly in its enforced emptiness. According to Eleanor Brooks, however, it was not empty at all, but busy, disordered and jumbled. Dare I say it, a bit like your head, Dad. Mind like a roulette ball, forever skittering around, forever pulling into the wrong slot. It was absolute chaos when I, we went to visit there. I never forget it. There was a gallon tin of golden syrup lying on its side with the lid not properly secure. But he hadn't bothered to pick it up. And the thread of golden syrup coming down from the table onto the stone floor on a puddle of golden syrup underneath. <laughs> you can't believe it. It was absolutely horrendous. <laughs> So memorably jumbled was the cottage that it inspired an exhibition created by Eleanor called Mrs. Spinks, an art installation that featured flourishes lifted directly from my dad's time up on the midnight, something that wasn't lost on him when he visited the exhibition during the early 70s. Anyway, Christopher looked at this Mrs. Spinks room and said, Reminiscent of a certain period of my life. Chaotic it may have been, but it wasn't without its bonuses. Wonderful big heavy table, the kind of table you could chop on. That table sounds great. I'd love to write there, Dad. And you did write, but mostly, of course, about how you can't. My body and mind, capable of short-lived athleticism, the interceptions, the five-yard bursts at Rugger, or of brief lyricism. It is not laziness that deters me from hard graft, physical or mental, but the knowledge that I lack the stamina for prolonged effort. My body, that is agile and wiry, looks ponderous and strong. So basic is my yearning for anchorage that my mind, shiftless, volatile, questing, at first meeting reflects illusorily some of the trappings of strength. I am not as I seem. And so begins a fresh round of excuses and justifications for things as they are. The projections of other people's ambitions, then the enthusiasms withdrawn. Something made me obstinately resent the whole process and say to myself, very well, I will be a writer, a statesman, if only in my mind, and nothing less. I am the true oblation for the sins of the public school systems. I have not ignored their values merely transgress them. And because one was set tests and not taught to arrive at a tempo of one's own for either work or recreation, one having spent one's life resisting discipline, eschewing curricula, one is chartless in the void and unable to do any- Okay, Dad. Perhaps everything you say is true. Your inability to write is the fault of the public school system, a lack of stamina, that it's your mother, your father, your ex-wife. But can't you see that the only constant in all of this is you. Actually, I know you can. The whole elaborate edifice for portioning the blame for my self-destruction, this determination to persist with the old stupidities, to maintain the defenceless, open-handed, gin-swilling fiction, so as to not confess the absolute grisly failure the resentment of a man who wakes to the realisation that he has allowed himself to be fooled is as nothing to that of one who tardily becomes aware that he has fooled himself. However cold, hungry, lonely and desperate my father may have been at this time, his life wasn't entirely without colour. 
because it does seem that his affair with Ivor's wife, Bill, real name Doris, coded D in the diaries, was ongoing. Phoning from the AA box on the midnight, coming down like a soldier, blundering out of the jungle, falling on D like a starving man. The act, that of a man in a creation reaction, but in reality, one in the last throes of frustration and disintegration. I think to pick on those which are already vulnerable, wives and widows and other people's relatives. That's the voice of my half-brother, David Wordsworth. They were sort of guilty, they were guilty parts. You didn't have to make any effort to romance them. Uh, it, it, they were sort of, in a funny way, more available. They no, wasn't big on commitment. I shall play on this feeling that she is trusting in a future domesticity. Must nurse it through to the moment when I can find another peg. A little petrol flame of love to clean my plugs before starting the machine. Growing up, I had a distant sense of my dad's past as a philanderer. But this was based only on throwaway remarks heavy with suggestion. A knowing nod amongst friends. Something about his bearing and presence. Not so much a ladies' man as an adulteress's man. Was he unfaithful to my mum? As with the notion of him being violent towards her, I very much doubt it. Again, I doubt my mother would have stood for it, and my dad would not have made much of an infidel, lacking the smarts to hide his tracks, though of course it's possible. In the mid-70s, and according to my brother, he had designs on, wait for it, Ivor and Bill's daughter Barbara, though I believe this came to nothing and was merely the muscle memory of an old Lothario. No, he didn't make a pass. He no. never did to me. This is my godmother, Miriam Gross, featured in episode one, and someone once described by Clive James as the most beautiful woman on Fleet Street. In the diaries, he talks about numbers, um, yes. weights of numbers. Of women <laughs> yes, well, I, I can imagine, but he was already quite... Not to say he'd stopped doing this kind of thing, but so he was already... I'm not saying that 55 is a very good age for making passes, but anyway, he never, he never did to me. He never did. But here, too, is author and broadcaster Mavis Nicholson, a close friend of my parents through her journalist husband, Jeff, and a neighbour when they moved to Mid Wales in the mid-90s. Mavis died on the same day as the Queen, something that I'm sure would have upset her no end but I was thankful to see her one last time in late 2021. He really thought he ought to be able to have you if he wanted you. And I said to him, do you mind if I tell you something now? You and I can be good friends, we can have good laughs, uh, but uh, I said nothing more. I'm devoted to Jeff. He was pretty callous about himself and passes with women. Mavis and my dad had a tempestuous friendship, based partly on him very obviously thinking himself superior in every way to Mavis, once even declaring that he would make a better interviewer than her, she whom upon her death was judged the best long-form interviewer there ever was. The idea that he thought he could have his own TV show, mm. the Christopher Wordsworth show. Quite with his own house band. <laughs> <laughs> it is true that my dad was an excellent listener, though only when he was talking. Of course, this sparring partnership may have had a basis in her spurning his advances. He was never easy. And if I had a, a success and somebody said it to me in the room, oh, he was furious. He would be sometimes seized with annoyance if something new would happen to me. But I remember once saying to him, you shouldn't really interfere like you did tonight or something. I can't remember what it was. And he, he said to me, what are you talking about? People think I'm marvellous. And I said, yes, they do. But they also get pissed off with some of you, the way you, you respond to them. Mm. I said, you should be careful. He said, you're a fine one. 
you know, and then ran me down like mad, just saying that uh, I wasn't popular at all. And I said, Christopher, I'm more popular than you are. My clock is like certain women I could nominate. It must be laid on its back before it functions at all, has a harsh and irregular tick, needs constant shaking, gains or loses at an undisclosed whim, and its silence is more oppressive than its voice. Meanwhile, back in 1959, my father is measuring out his life in diminishing resources. The Caligas seeping away, the dial of the wireless battery, Aladdin showing the diminishing level, plaster not peeling but falling in chunks, chicken licking. It is like watching the taxi meter hypnotically and feeling for the rutted edges of the last few coins in one's pocket. I want a tank of paraffin, one of those cylinders of gas as tall as a grenadier. And whilst the novel is of course talked of, there are no signs of progress. The bareness of it, the disintegration, still amassing the introspective jottings, bundling time away from week to week, all the while the facade of working, of progress. Why is the only alternative to me for the failure of creation, destruction? Is there nothing between a palace of crystal and a cave of skulls? Around this time, his friend John Earl has a recollection of seeing my dad from a distance and mistaking him for a tramp. I say mistaking. In actual fact, that's more or less what he was. We saw him walking across the, uh, the, the moorland with a sack draped over his back on the most appalling, boring weather. I remember you know, the, the, the rain and his beard and there was this poor old tramp sort of thing. As the calendar clicked over into 1960, little had changed up on the midnight. No progress had been made with the novel, and his affair with Bill appears finally to have fizzled out. There is a sense of haunting that my father is plagued by his thoughts. Night. The recruiting centre for the inexhaustible army of shadows that make war on us. The past. If I am to spend any time there, I must clear it up, so that there is room to move about in it. At the moment I am in the process of clearing things only. I cannot come and go in it with any ease. And inevitably, there is a return, once again, to one of his central themes. That moment in Iraq. I am faced with the law if I tell the truth. But I am past the obligations of art. It is a battle for a moment of the attention of the conscience of the world. I must show in my novel how after Iraq it was only the reflex action of the back-broken snake, and how Iraq was inevitable from what went before. More than any other in my life, I have been the prisoner of two events. Striking a pregnant Joan, and that moment in Iraq. And there is an interconnection. At least the guilt of one hampered my maintaining my innocence, come what may, in the other. Uh, and what is your surname? It's Wordsworth. Wordsworth with a W. Ah, this one? Yeah, that's me. In the previous episode, I was able to access my father's war record from the British Library. Whilst it didn't offer up a smoking gun, it pointed towards my father being shipped out, possibly at speed, from the campaign in the Middle East. So I headed to the National Archives in Kew, South West London, to see if I could find out more. So once my colleagues put you on your seat, you can order any additional documents you might need. Okay. You, can, you order them in batches of three, they take an hour to produce, okay. and then you can order another batch of three and so on. And so on. Since there had been nothing in his official war file, I had to approach the subject stealthily and from the side. 
As such, I had pre-ordered a bundle of war diaries written by contemporaries from his Indian Army Regiment, the 6th Rajputana Rifles. There was a wealth of material, but despite some extensive trawling, I didn't find any mention of my dad. I was, though, able to pick the brains of an archivist there, particularly in light of a new line I'd come across in the diaries. My father... Perhaps I owe him for the fact that Iraq was not a final disgrace. You may recall from episode one that my grandfather William, my dad's dad, was a highly influential statesman and civil servant in India. Based on this entry, it seems likely that William used his influence to get my dad off a charge. It's possible that whatever he did could have been dealt with on a sort of summary basis by his commanding officer because unit commanders do have a certain amount of leeway to decide how to deal with things at their own discretion. I mean, if it was hushed up later or whatever, then you may still find something in a war diary, but it may just have been something where there was a gentleman's understanding that he would depart. Mm. Um, So it might not have come to light and the other problem is that um, a lot of these annotations on the records Mm. they are for administrative purposes there was a whole language of acronyms and abbreviations that the clerks all understood the meaning of it has largely died with that generation of clerks I'm afraid perhaps I owe him for the fact that Iraq was not a final disgrace This was an important development, but what was the charge, the disgrace, this moment in Iraq? I put this question to my cousin, Paul Wordsworth, when we met up at his home in Oxfordshire. That suddenly just rang a vague bell. I was hoping that Paul, 20 years my senior, might have gained insight from his own father, my uncle Victor, the youngest of the Wordsworth clan. I have no idea why that rings a vague bell, whether it's something I've heard from you before, whether it's something I've heard from my mother, my father. It's just, it, it's just something that doesn't come completely out of the blue. Paul told me a story about my dad stealing army mess funds. Classic dad. Though we both agreed this wouldn't qualify as a moment. I don't know whether you could try looking at any kind of English language Indian papers. If it was something sort of dishonourable, well, it's less likely to have made the papers. I mean, periods of active service could be very stressful, even if there wasn't a lot going on, you know. I mean, people didn't have to be involved in a a sort of big battle, and it's not, not a matter of weakness on their part, it's just that army life, garrison life or whatever just can be very wearing and stressful loneliness and and just a very monotonous harsh routine whatever the disgrace was perhaps it was kept between my father and my grandfather maybe it was too toxic too damaging to be shared and then i came across this the shirt with the sleeves tied together to keep it on the hanger flapping in the wind or to pin a placard to it He raped a white girl. It's hard to know what to make of this rather disturbing entry. It's cryptic, appears out of nowhere, and frankly, I don't know what it means. But in the interests of full disclosure, I felt I should include it. Whether it relates to my father's disgrace is entirely unclear. What I took away from Q is that whatever it was that he did was very likely not recorded officially, but perhaps thrashed out at a gentleman's level, leading to my father being swiftly deposed as an officer and shipped out of Iraq and the Allies' pay force operation, though not formally disgraced. But as we'll discover in the final two episodes, the diaries contain fresh suggestions that may point in a different direction, and together with other information, will lead me to a final conclusion. Meanwhile, back on the midnight. 
I'm in desperation and I've practically given up on the book. There are 12 pages written and I sit before them every morning, day after day, for the last two months, and cannot add a sentence, add a word. When I face that fated manuscript, it seems to me that I have forgotten how to think. Worse, how to write. It is as if something in my head has given way to let in a cold, grey mist. Unable to commit his novel to the page and struggling with isolation, my father is facing a second winter exposed to the elements. Money, good name, it only remains to lose my health. I am terrified that the moment I let go, see hopelessness in my situation, my health will crash, like the veil of a temple rent across. There is a sense that time, perhaps even hope, is running out. Time that was once the dog at my heels is now the wolf at my throat. But it was during this period, moving neither forwards nor back, that something remarkable happens, a moment and an opportunity that would change everything for my father, rescue him from his parlour situation and propel him onto a fresh path. My dad's relationship with Jeremy Brooks was a curious one. Back in 1953, when moving in with Brooks's, he had behaved pretty badly, using Jeremy's money, taking him away from his family and Jeremy's own writing. And yet, as was so often the case, Jeremy liked him. Unusual, difficult, but brilliant people are often given leeway, and Jeremy put up with the slights and spites in return for the wit, the entertainment, the knowledge and the appreciation of literature. He clearly thought my father character enough to make him the central figure in his novel The Water Carnival. Cynical appreciation of the motive underlying Jeremy's letters. He is milking me of data for a novel about my predicament. Even this is being filched from me. Perhaps he felt he owed my dad a debt of gratitude which informed his contributing to the rent of Tea Keeper. Though I'm not sure Jeremy believed my dad would necessarily write his novel. After all, this is what one of the characters in The Water Carnival says. Do you think he's even talented? Not for a second. Of course, anyone can be wrong about a thing like that, but I put a pretty heavy bet against his ever writing 10 coherent pages. Hold that thought. In early 1960, Philip Toynbee, chief literary critic with the Observer newspaper, put out a request within its pages for essays from those who felt themselves to live outside the normal confines of society. The best ones would be selected and published the following year in a book entitled Underdogs. One afternoon, Jeremy visited my father at Tea Keeper bringing with him instant coffee, tins, bread, and the page from the Observer displaying the Toynbee request. My dad may have been struggling with his novel, but what if he could produce something shorter, more focused? Better still, something about his own life, a subject in which he was totally and utterly absorbed. And so, slowly but surely, he starts writing. If, through binoculars, you watched a figure spread-eagled against the north face of the Eiger, for an hour it hangs there. You can see the head move as it looks on all sides for a hold. The ice axe change restlessly from hand to hand. You see the figure make a few movements that even at that remove are plainly incisive, and the dot commences a steady and uninterrupted ascent to the pinnacle. Immediately, what seemed an hour of helpless indecision is cast into fresh relief. So I aim it shall be with this task. I do not know if it can be done. That sheer, relentless pressure will start one up the rock face. To climb above the grip of vertigo.
I believe that my father recognises that this is a chance, his chance, perhaps his only chance, to break out of his self-imposed exile and the pattern of hopelessness and helplessness. Jeremy may well have encouraged him, underlining what it might mean if the planets converged, that if somehow, against the odds and the evidence of a lifetime, 46 years to this point, he was able to compact his talents, apply all that reading and learning, and manifest his gift for the written word, maybe, just maybe, the gears may mesh, and something may come of it. Fellow songsters, with overtones of underdog and undertones of overdog, with whom perhaps I shall be kenneled between these covers, greetings. How ashamed we shall be to be seen in each other's company. Underdogs, Anguish and Anxiety, 18 Victims of Society, was published in 1961. In amongst essays from criminals, homosexuals and self-declared failures, sits a contribution from A and Other entitled The Self-Inflicted Wound, my father's essay. Up here there is a sword sheen on the wind-blown rushes, and the young river wells out of the bog, dark and bubbling, like a sudden staunchless wound. My world is not peopled by men and women. My realities are the weather, the possession or lack of a bottle of paraffin, the impending demise of a shirt, the level of the stream, direction of the wind, the existence of a leak in my fishing waders. My assets are briefly enumerated. The knack of catching trout in small troubled waters, a handful of friends and enemies on whom I inflict a rasping tongue and a marshmallow heart, a habit of gnomic, almost vatic utterance from a brain stuffed hugger-mugger with literature, a skull full of rubble and a pen full of tropes, but no peace. By any standards, the self-inflicted wound is an extraordinary piece of writing. Self-lacerating and unsparing, it was singled out in Toynbee's foreword as a welcome super addition to the collection and for what he calls its exceptional literary ability. My friends will not let me starve. Quite. Nor will I allow them to. Quite. At one time, it appeared they cordoned me off and sought to ostracise me back into conformity. Now, from time to time, I visit them and they appear glad to see me walking great distances and arrayed in a variety of their donated garments. If I bite the hands that feed me, it is because I am hungry for more than friends can spare. Lost bread, the pampered you of a love that does not survey my acts or make concessions, but loves me as I love myself, irrefutably and without end. My father's talent for the written word threatened for so long had finally materialised on the printed page. And whilst rarely lingering on specifics, it does touch on his time with Sue. The last and loveliest with whom I shared my life left me 18 months ago, accompanied by what is technically known as the duly authorised officer. It lasted five years, and those who had known that she was a paranoid schizophrenic but had not thought to mention it did not concede it a chance to endure six months. I shall not write of her here. She is dowered as few can hope to be and flawed beyond despair. When love seemed a relevant word, we lived a life of hermetic seclusion. When I woke to the truth of her condition, I had the fatuity to believe that I could opposite myself to it and succeed. There are no witnesses. To be the paramour of one held to be a maniac is not precisely to live in society, more especially if she is related to illustrious men. At best, it fascinated morbidly those who can fancy themselves pitying the plumage, yet walk wide of the dying bird. But live on. There will not be a time when I shall not remember you. 
At 11 pages long, it just edges out Jeremy's prediction in the water carnival that Oliver Earl would never produce 10 coherent pages. Though he'd already got the practice in, the essay being mostly a microcosm of the diaries, the subject almost entirely the self, heading round in a kind of brilliant circle, but a circle nonetheless. The self-inflicted wound is beautifully written as a prose poem. Here's my brother, David Wordsworth. It fed on itself. There's no narrative there, really. The pieces he wrote were really good, but they should have been written by somebody 30 years younger. They're like opening works if somebody goes on to be a great writer, but, but it's, it's a lovely piece of writing. The self-inflicted wound ends on a note of uncertainty and fatigue. Suddenly I find myself sick of this and wish to break it off. How will I end this piece, I am asked, and what do I think will be the outcome of my affairs? I will leave it open, but the prognosis is not good. It cannot be when the wax is reduced to screaming at the stylus. I try to write, but the erosion of my own identity and the slow loss of fact may rule out fiction. The exasperated concern of others will reach its term. Friends and enemies have done their best and worst. A spring ago, a person of no great fastidiousness unpacked herself for me in an idle moment. But all that I found in that community chest was a heart like a parched pea. The therapy of the kick up the backside will soon be tried again. Though it is doubtful whether it can be effective with a person who has been kicked by a heavier boot in a more vital spot. I still have the temerity to hope to drift along, unless I choke on a metaphor or founder in my own bile. So? Make sure you subscribe to this series, as the essay will feature in full in a bonus episode. Underdogs was a popular and successful book, all the more so as it was serialised in the pages of The Observer, my father's essay reproduced in full and garnering particular praise. The result? Opportunity, something that my father would, for once in his life, make the most of, and that would see him embark upon a new chapter in his life, that of a working man, even a public figure, albeit in a very minor way. In Philip Toynbee, Dad found a champion, someone who recognised his skills. Toynbee offered my father, in the first instance, a smattering of book reviews for The Observer. Recognising the importance of this chance, my dad took them on. Everything but breath, bread and water and will is inessential. One discovers this in extremities parting with a hundred conceptions of what had seemed basic to existence. And on the spiritual side, within the expendable clinkers, love, etc., nestles the ultimate diamond of self-protection. Despite the impending publication of underdogs, his own circumstances hadn't changed, for now at least. He was still trudging up and down, but it was on one of these voyages into civilization that he met Margaret Ahern. This is Eleanor Brooks on Margaret. Energetic, enterprising. She married, had these three children, and then her husband got cancer, I think, or something fatal. She knew it, he was going to uh, die. And then no money. And so she wrote to Clough. She'd heard of Clough's estate here, the, all these empty, derelict cottages. She wrote to Clough and asked for a cottage. So he gave her one. Francis Ullman, Eleanor's neighbour, who appeared in the previous episode, picks up the story. Well, Margaret was living up here. Um, she was living in a place called Tanabrin, which is up on near Croesaw. And she was farming. Um, in a very small scale. She would have met Christopher either in the ring or locally, and somehow they got into a relationship. And the next thing was she was pregnant. 
Odd that I like all the right things and understand them more than most. Cricket, dry fly, poetry. And the troll that frisks between my legs bobs up and cooks my goose. Margaret, being a good Catholic, insisted they get married, and a date was hastily set. The marriage took place in early 1961. I didn't go to their wedding, Jeremy did. Jeremy and Chris Oliver went to, the, to their wedding. <laughs> Chris Oliver did a really, really funny sort of a little play of their wedding for me when they came down from it, uh, imitating Chris and so on. After the ceremony, a pregnant Margaret returns home to tend to the children. Festivities, meanwhile, continued in the ring in Hanfrotten. Christopher went out to celebrate in the, in the ring, I believe, with some friends, and didn't return on his wedding night, this is. Didn't return until three or four o'clock in the morning. And when he returned, eventually got back to Tannabryn, where Margaret was living with her three children and the fourth one on the way. Um, all his stuff was outside. She bagged it up, put it in plastic rubbish sacks, and that was him out. What Francis doesn't say, but had explained previously off mic, was that this was an apparent deliberate act by my father, calculated to provoke a snub and ultimately end the marriage. And it worked. As far as I know, they never saw each other again. I think Margaret, once she'd made up her mind, would about something wouldn't, wouldn't change it. She was quite a strong-minded lady and she wouldn't be easily messed around. A few months later, my half-brother Richard was born. Richard, by my reckoning now 61, lives in the area as a farmer in a property one along from Francis. I have never met him, though I'm assured that with his beard, he bears more than a passing resemblance to our father. What about Richard Ahern and the Ahern? Oh, well, you see that? Richard won't talk about it, I'm sure, will he? No, well, he won't talk to me. That's the voice of Lucia Jones, daughter of John Jones, and still resident in the Croiser Valley. Mm, he's a farmer, a very good farmer. Mm. Um, but he doesn't want to know. What does he look like? He's very handsome, extremely good looking. He's, he's he older looks? now, but, you know, he, he, as a young man, he was extremely good looking. When I visited the valley in the summer of 2022, I found myself almost without realising driving towards his farm, not quite sure what I was doing, but with the loose intention of knocking. As I approached the entrance to the driveway, I received a call from Francis, who said he was now home and would I like to come up, which I think was a good thing, as in discussion with Francis, it became clear to me, if the penny hadn't already dropped after conversation with Eleanor, that Richard probably wouldn't welcome me with open arms, which is entirely understandable. Um, yes, I don't think you, I think you'll find a very wary. Um, I think it would take quite a while to get to, I don't know. I, he won't talk to me. He never talks to me. He ignores me. If I say hello, he doesn't say hello. I think he thinks I uh, was friends, you know, well, obviously we were friends of a sort but he probably thinks I approved of him more than I actually did. My private beach is strewn with the spurs of a hundred wrecked relationships. A one-minute silence to commemorate the final demise of a reputation. When I was growing up, Dad would be disparaging about this brief interlude in his life, declaring that he couldn't possibly stay with a woman whose favourite book was a glorified account of some wartime raid. But this was his usual packaging up of complex events to mask a more difficult truth. And it wasn't a great look. He chose Margaret, knew she was a widow, knew she had three children, knew she was a Catholic. He made his own bed, but as ever, he didn't sleep in it. In the mid-80s, when we were visiting the area, a meeting between my father and Richard was brokered by a mutual acquaintance. As Dad entered the pub to greet for the first time his 20-something son, Richard Rose said, I only wanted to see what you looked like, 
and walked out. My father was extremely shaken up by this event, but dare I say it, it's the least he deserves. This is Emma Pardo, the daughter of one of my parents' friends and a resident of the Clough Estate for the past 30 years, one of the last English-speaking visitors. Well, I'm afraid he, that's what happens. He probably deserved a bit of a kick yes. in there. Um, they do look similar, of course, all that facial hair. Now I can see something, yes. I've and never it, seen him. My father lived most of his life not acknowledging or appreciating the consequences of his actions, avoiding responsibility and leaving varying levels of destruction in his wake. For every person who appreciated his wit and erudition, there is another licking their wounds. I discharge my responsibilities like firecrackers. Before we end this episode, a quick recap or rundown of my father's children. First up, there's David and his sister Diana from his marriage to Joan Darlington. That makes two. Richard from his marriage to Margaret Ahern makes three. And there's me from his partnership with my mother, Tamara Salomon, four. Four children from three marriages. Is that right? With what aloof doggedness I stalked her from continent to continent. And this is the inventory. The clap twice. A heart in shards. Two children sacrificed. A dirty paragraph or so in Somerset House. A girl love child. A piebald offering in the green groves of Pecan. A sad, sorry tale. Wait, what? A piebald offering in the green... Not that bit, Dad. You know the bit I mean. A girl love child. That bit. Back in 2009... The Guardian published an essay I wrote about my dad. This predated my having read the diaries, but it still made for a decent yarn and led to a number of people reaching out via email from his past. Alongside recollections of his ferocious snoring, my dad as fishing teacher and this one from one of Richard's half-sisters. I read your Guardian memoir. I was your stepsister. Your father also had a remarkably cruel and undesirable side. My brother never knew your father, but knew that he was worthless enough in his eyes not to warrant any contact for nearly 18 years, and not to be worthy of any financial support either. You were lucky to find something of merit about this man. Our memories are of a complete shit. There was this, from a man called Henry. May I tell you of a woman I know? She is frail now. Fifty years of smoking. TB, four children with only one surviving, take their toll on even the hardiest. A person of strong intellect and passionately held beliefs. A woman of words and a published poet. She was brought up by her grandparents during the war. Desperate for her own independence, she joined the RAF at 16 and became the youngest sergeant they had at 18. Of course, she is my mother. But she is also your half-sister. She never met her, your father, but from your memoir of him I can see a striking resemblance in looks and personality traits. Thank you for bringing my grandfather to life for me. As you might imagine, this came as something of a shock. So I wrote back, requesting corroboration and an image. Good afternoon, Saul. I didn't mean to spook you, but I guess this would come as a surprise. She was born to a Grace Miller, a woman she detested, and went to extraordinary lengths to avoid. My mum was born in January 1935, to the place Grace was sent, so I'm told, for much of her confinement, to hide the shame of being an unmarried mother. Your father is on her birth certificate. I have attached a photo of my mum from a long time ago. You see if there is a resemblance. Regards, Henry. When I saw the picture, any doubt I had evaporated. Unquestionably, this woman was my dad's daughter and my half-sister. Henry and I struck up a correspondence. Hello, half-uncle Saul. Would your father have approved of your no-capitals punctuation? 
You have many questions that I cannot answer for definite. I certainly got the impression that Christopher knew of Grace's condition. I also believe that some of your father's inheritance may have gone to keep things quiet. That part of the bargain seems to have worked. All I know is that my mum has felt rejected all her life. Especially having to live through a time where all the village children called you a bastard. The most hurtful word in the English language, according to mum. Mum was certainly aware of her father and what he did. Although I don't believe his fame came until she was older. I can't speak for her as to why she didn't get in touch. But I believe it was partly the feeling of original rejection and the wish not to destabilise another family. You have to remember, Mum is a very private person, hence my protection of her whereabouts. She clams up about her past, and you have to coax information out of her. Then one final message. So, here's Mum's response to a note I'd sent her about your article, and seeing if she wanted to know more about her father. This may upset you, as it is the result of so many years of fermenting ideas, feelings, assumption, yearning, hurt. I'm sure you know the older people become, the more set in their ways they become. Mum has always been intensely private and would be mortified if she knew we were in communication. Dearest Henry, thank you for your note. Yes, I was aware of the article written by Soul W. I'm waiting for some clips to be done and was going to send you a copy. I have carried the genes of my parents all my life and although I've always known who they were, I've never once had the inclination to probe their lives. However, I do believe in nature, over nurture, and most decidedly carry his bloody genes to a large extent. Basically, the written word has been the driving force of my being. It colours everything I do, more than you will ever know. Like him, my boredom threshold is very low. I find the mundane excruciatingly dull. Once in a while, one meets those of like ilk. Not often. When I read CW's obituary, it was blindingly obvious that that were the reason why I have so little in common with most of my relatives. Even those who, on the whole, have been good to me. It was like the curtain lifting on a long-held puzzle. Yes, I have a short fuse. Yes, I don't suffer fools gladly either. I love the tranquility of solitude and I don't need others to give me my life fulfilment. Unfortunately, I don't give love indiscriminately. To me, it is for life and remains so. It has cost me everything and I am so unlike him in that respect. The reason, in my opinion, why CW never wrote a novel is why I could never write one either. We both can only deal with the truth, however bizarre that truth may be to others. When I was ten year old I won my first prize for English and went on to win many more. My final thoughts on CW. He was a complete and utter bastard of the male species. Really bad news for women. And possibly kids. Ever. Mum. Patricia, Paddy as she was known, died in January 2022, aged 88. I never met her. She never knew I knew about her. Dad never mentioned her existence to me, nor, I believe, to my mother. In 2021, I joined Ancestry to see if he had fathered any other children. Nothing appeared, though I should probably check in at various intervals. I was, though, interested in something Paddy said at the end. My final thoughts on C.W. He was a complete and utter bastard of the male species. Really bad news for women. And possibly kids. This podcast is nothing if not about consequences. Because make no mistake, although he had five children in total, he almost entirely neglected the other four. Save for some early money to manage the pregnancy, Paddy received nothing. My half-brother David, a brilliant young student, endured a difficult early life as a result of his absence, including a period of homelessness. 
His sister Diana was older, left home and went to work as an assistant to Lord Snowden in his photographic studio. But she died in a car accident in the early 70s, colliding with an oncoming vehicle while overtaking on a blind bend. Richard, I believe, has made a decent life for himself in North Wales, but holds understandable resentment towards my father, who offered nothing in terms of material comfort or emotional support. Which just leaves me. So what did I get? I got it all. All the attention. All the dedication. All the everything. All of it. That thing Jung says, the greatest burden for the child is the unlived life of the parents. I mean, there... That, that book should have been born and he would have been much cooler. Yeah. He loved you so much he wanted you to be... He just kind of smothered you with expectation. He did. He did. Mm. And actually, it kind of... It, it led me to breaking point, mm. in fact, I, uh, which is something that I, mm. I talk about in the podcast. When I was born, my elderly dad transferred all his love and the weight of his own hopes and expectations onto me. I live through you, Saul, was a common refrain. My mother hated it when he said this. I didn't mind. It was all I knew. But as I will explore in the final episodes, I think it did affect me, crept up on me, until one day in 1992, I was blindsided and it, or something like it, took me down. By 1962, my father's time in the Kreuzer Valley was coming to an end. As his circumstances begin to shift and the light of opportunity streams through the cracks, he recognises that his time is nearly up. I have learned, late and painfully, my character has taken some nasty sapping. But I am still unimpaired. All the while I am shedding superfluous baggage learning late my false appraisal of life, coming to understand myself and the quintessential starkness of the world. Only now am I leaving adolescence behind me. The barren feeling is lifting, and with it, the sense of endlessly going round and round like a mouse in a milk churn. I have the materials of my medium to hand in endless profusion, enough to last me all my days. My father is about to depart the valley and start a new life in London, but old fears still hang over him, and the diaries will throw up new clues about that moment in Iraq. Next time on Devil in the Wilderness. If you ever want another child, co-opt me. He'll be bright and good at games, and he'll bring little happiness, least of all to himself. I'll try to contribute to his upbringing. This episode is dedicated to Eleanor Brooks, who died in August 2022. Oh, Eleanor. Well, she was the wisest person I knew. She always gave terrific advice. Um, Succinct. She wasn't sentimental at all. Um, Very intelligent. And... Very wise, yes. And born into aristocracy, I believe. Yes, she kind of says that all her all her aunts were ladies in waiting. <laughs> um, the Nevilles, yeah. they are quite grand, I think. But she took a different path. Very, yes. Thank you, Ellen. Now you've, um, you're the, as you said, you're the last one standing. I think I'm not probably am, yeah. What does the day hold for you? The day. Well, sometimes the days are very long. I've had a nice long read this morning. I'm reading Mary Shelley's, the biography of Mary Shelley by Muriel Spark. Devil in the Wilderness was written and produced by me, Saul Wordsworth. Original music from the series, such as this track, is also by me and is available on Spotify. Links in the show notes. The executive producer of the series is Paul Kobrak. The voice of my father is performed by Chris Porter. 
Other voices in this episode in order of appearance are Ian Pollock, Hanya McLagan, Chris Jack Raborty, and Jess Salomon. <laughs>